like Manitoba and the short introduction would just be Mia is awesome. So, well, no, okay, is so it a little bit longer version behind awesomeness involves that she has been doing a PhD on apostle birds, looking at acoustics and social structure. She then did uh, various uh, different things, looking more into conservation-related questions, also working in many different places, and just been recently had a lot of media attention for her COVID work, looking at the change of human activities in relation to what this does to the birds. However, what she really is going to show us today is what she's working now, that's on the African ground squirrels and all I can say, I mean, it's probably the cutest uh, study species I've seen for a very long time. So I'm looking forward to your talk, Mia. Thank you for that uh, lovely introduction. Um, and thanks, everybody, for coming today. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm really excited to share with you um, one aspect of my research. Um, like I said, I am from the University of Manitoba, and this is in Canada. So we start all of our talks with acknowledging um, the land. So these campuses are located on the original lands of the, uh, of the Ashinabe, the Cree, the Oji Cree, the Dakota, and Dene peoples, and also on the homeland of the Métis nations. And so therefore, just to acknowledge uh, the treaties and how we're moving forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. And while I'm on the topic, I'm just going to start by thanking everybody that's been involved. I, rep I present to you a lot of work today, which draws on a very long-term study going back um, two decades now. And therefore, we've had a lot of people involved across different countries. So I'd really like to thank the Northwest Parks and Tourism in South Africa, as well as the staff at SA Lombard Nature Reserve, and all the student collaborators I've been involved with and working with continuously. Got lots of people involved um, in this study, and so I came onto this project maybe about a year and a half ago, and I come from a quite a varied background. I start off in ecology and conservation, and working with a lot of endangered species and things like that. And so I worked on the west coast of Canada with these marble mirrorlets. I moved on to uh, Hawaii, and this is where I first got an introduction into um, very social species with these Hawaiian crows. There we, there we go, right here. So for my PhD, then I worked on um, apostle birds, which are co-opter baiting birds. Uh, lots of questions around sociality and acoustic communication. And then some postdocs on these grassland species and on some Caribbean species as well that um, varied in their social structure and again, lots of conservation, uh, ecological questions before making a jump to mammals, which is what I'm talking to you about with the uh, Cape Ground squirrels today. So. I am largely field-based. I love being in the field. Um, a lot of people that previously know me know me for going around with uh, recording devices almost all the time attached to me, recording animals. But then I employ a variety of techniques, including a molecular um, genetics, uh, sampling, trapping, uh, measuring, uh, nocturnal during the day, anything goes. So pretty much a lot of fun there. So today I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about, um, so give you some background information on uh, group living and some, some of the social questions I'm interested in, as well as why I might even, why we'd even consider studying squirrels before moving on to the Cape Ground squirrels and just linking this all to some of the uh, issues today with ecology and climate change. All right, so some of the questions I'm really interested in, in now and what I'm presenting today are is the association between social complexity and cooperation. So what are the benefits and costs of living in a group? Um, how does social complexity vary within and between species? And how these uh, benefits uh, differ as a result of all this social complexity? And finally, how the social complexity influences cooperation. So, Group living occurs in different diverse animal lineages. We see in insects, uh, fish, uh, mammals, birds, and it's, 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 it's what, and one of the things I, I tell people is because we're very social species, humans, uh, a lot of people th think that, that you know, sociality is almost actually like a default, um, but this is not the case, that actually uh, most animals actually are, are not social. So why even look at social species? And there are a lot of different benefits to group living. And I'm not going to go into all those details now. There's a lot of different 
books on this. There's a lot of different reviews that you can, you can read. But just to give you a little bit of overview of what that might be, we that we have, um, for instance, animals can benefit from anti-predators, um, like these black-tailed prairie dogs and a lot of these uh, small mammals, they, they actually have really well-developed alarm systems and ways of dealing with predators. We got foraging efficiency, like uh, cooperative hunting, as we see in Arctic wolves. And then we can get territory defense. Um, and then down with the opossibers, we can get the care of young and uh, helping each other um, produce young. Then we got burrow digging. And even we have um, group uh, thermal regulation and, and group hibernation. So with all these different benefits, um, you can end up with uh, this large variation, driving this large variation in, in social systems as a result of all of these different ways animals can benefit for living in a social groups. Um, to give you an example of this, we have um, some of the species that I've worked with, um, just to show you the variation in social systems. Keep your hand the wrong one. For instance, we got these uh, banana quits here, which are pair living only during the breeding season. And then we got these uh, Hawaiian crows and their family living. And then we have the opossibers, which are living in, in groups with kin and non-kin. And um, they are cooperative breeding, so they help each other raise, um, or not help each other raise their young. There are, there are adults who are helping to raise young that are not their own. So, what do I mean by social complexity? Um, this is actually a very wide topic, and uh, what I'm going to be referring to today is just using this framework, um, which breaks down the social system into a variety of different uh, topics. And uh, as you see, it's, there's just a lot of ways that we can talk about social complexity. And even within any one of these particular um, topics, we can get a lot of social, I mean, a lot of complexity within that. So for example, let's give you an idea, let's just look at group composition, which is something that should be relatively um, simple in the sense to follow. Okay, what, what is the group comprised of? Well, a group can vary in, in sex, um, uh, whether or not it's all males or all females or mixed, for example, for example, we have these polar bears, and uh, most people don't realize that polar bears actually will aggregate in male groups outside of the breeding season, and you'll see them in actually groups, and they're doing this to assess um, competitive ability between them. Now, we can also see groups that vary in different ages, as you see in these elephants here, which um, this here is a group, a uh, bachelor herd of, of male elephants. Now, they're all males, but and all adult males, but they vary in the age because they're really long-lived species. So we got very younger males, which are adult, and then really older males. So you can also see this variation in relatedness. Right here, you got these family living tree skinks, and they're really cool. They're actually facultatively social, which means that they're um, asocial a lot of the time, and then sometimes they form these social groups. And these social groups are made up of um, either parent-offspring pairs or, or sibling pairs. So they are related um, groups. And then we can see variation in breeding status. For example, if you look at uh, surrogates or the meerkats, that there's a dominant breeding pair, and then a lot of non-breeders, and in other species like the Cape ground squirrels, um, there's many, many breeders. And so that's just only a little bit of flavor of, of how social group composition can vary, can vary in so many different attributes. Remember, that's just one thing of that huge chart I just showed you earlier of how things can vary. So why do we even care about this variation in social systems? It's because this variation that we see in social systems is, um, can influence the cooperation or the type of cooperation or the extent of cooperation that we're seeing. So to give you an example of that, let's, let's, let's show you some cats here. So, oops, cats. Okay, so here we have the um, cheetahs. And uh, now cheetahs, uh, they, the females disperse, but the males uh, do not. Um, uh, and uh, so what 
you can sometimes see is that you got these male um, cheetahs, they're sibling pairs, and they're cooperatively hunting together. If you want to look at something a little bit more complex, you get the lion prides, and in this case, we have uh, females, um, of, and we got young in the group, and then we got the whole pride structure, and when you see the females, they cooperate, they're not just cooperating for one thing, they're cooperatively hunting, they're crushing the young. So of course you see much more complex social system in lions, a uh, greater extent of cooperation. So brings it, okay, so, so why, why study the squirrels? And I really think they're a really great study system because um, there are 285 species of squirrels worldwide, and this roughly breaks into about 50 genera, and um, they, they, they vary a lot. They vary in, in social structure. We have asocial um, squirrels, like the red squirrel, and we have those, those who live in different uh, arrangements, in different colonies, in different uh, types of groups, and um, all the way up to cooperative breeding squirrels. So you've got the whole variation in social complexity, um, and also in the behaviors, and even in, uh, we've got terrestrial, um, those that live in trees, and those that live on the ground. So we've got this huge variation in, in their um, life history traits as well. Now, the other beautiful thing about squirrels is that they are mostly diurnal. They're easy to trap. They're easy to measure, they're easy to watch, and, um, and they have been really well studied in temperate species. So we start to collectively, when you start to study, um, other people who study squirrels, we, we can get a really good picture of, of um, the differences between all these squirrels species. So what are the benefits to social living in, in squirrels? Well. The thing about squirrels is they're small and everything likes to eat them. So we got squirrels that they get predated from above by birds of prey. They have um, a whole range of terrestrial uh, mesopredators. Uh, you've got like foxes, uh, coyotes um, go into Africa and you got the jackals. And uh, they're small. And the, 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 because they're small, thermal regulation isn't super, super great for them. Um, because uh, you know, they have a large surface area to volume ratio so they can heat up and cool down quickly. So they have all these benefits though, of, of grouping together for anti-predator de defense, digging burrows, which is anti-predator and both, and both um, allows them protection for the elements, and, or they can be communal nesters, and we see them cooperative breeding as well. And like I just said, Earlier, we got squirrels, they, they vary in social complexity from the asocial uh, Eurasian red squirrel to the co-opter breeding Cape ground squirrels, and also um, the type of, and extent of cooperation that they exhibit. Ah, so this leads me to the Cape ground squirrels. So let me introduce you to my uh, the, the favorite squirrels of, uh, of all time for me, uh, is a Cape ground squirrels. Um, these are socially living creatures. They are herbivores, which means that they are eating grass seeds and um, they're not caught hunting together and they are, and their food source is heterogeneously distributed. On top of that, they're socially living. Um, okay. And they're burrowing species as well. So they cooperatively burrow together. Well, they live in the arid regions of South Africa. So if you, if you see the map there, you'll see that the bottom of South Africa, and they're living on, in the grasslands and the veldt areas. So you see um, they're, they're the grass, and it's, it's very open, so they, and we got some trees around, and there's a variety of grass seeds. Now, the thing about the South African um, ecosystems that they live in is that we got a rainy season and we got a dry season and so actually when it it rains it also happens to be hot at the same time so this actually creates quite a bit of difficulty for these squirrels because they don't actually like the rain they go underground and it creates a lot of mud and it's, it's as hot now, so they actually their peak breeding season even though they breed year-round is actually in in the winter when it's uh, drier and, and and cooler so this is our study site. We are at, oops, 
uh, SA Lombard Nature Reserve, and um, which is actually in, in the, the mid to high belt. And it looks a lot like this. We got lots of ungulates. It's a managed reserve, um, which means that they're managing a number of ungulates there. And it also means that there is hunting there as well. Um, so this is an ongoing study from 2002. And um, this means that we have two decades of data on this species at this site. And they have been continuously trapped and measured for a variety of measurements um, over the years. And we're able to mark them oops, with this hair dye and, uh, and able to follow them. So this is really great because it means that we have a huge amount of data to draw on and continuously um, look at the patterns and trends over the years. Um, okay, this is what is absolutely amazing about these creatures. They have no territories, they have no physical aggression, and they have no dominance hierarchy in some of the populations. Okay, no dominance hierarchy means that they are actually like on an equal footing. There's not one that is um, kind of beating up on the other to, to, to get uh, more benefits than others. It, but it's really interesting, I say, in some populations. And this means that in our site, where we have no d aggression, it's because it's a high-resource site. It rains a lot. There's lots of seeds. If you go to Namibia, you'll see that it's drier and more resource, um, uh, low resources. And we do see some hierarchies, but it's still not based on aggression. Even, and they're really hard to get because you have to stare at them and get displacements. But beyond that... So what's really cool is they have docile personalities. So this is, uh, my recent research has shown that when we look at docility, which is a response to capture and handling and is associated with social aggression, both males and females have docile personalities. So you go, okay, so, so what about docile personalities? I already said they, they weren't aggressive, right? So they're not aggressive, they're not aggressive. Well, actually there's some variation, meaning that some are super, super, not aggressive, and some just have some levels of social aggression, um, and this is maintained in the population and consistent with individuals. So, you know, what gives of that? I'll t show you in just a moment. So, in order to understand this, this lack of aggression, uh, we, we want to look at the social system variation. Now, this is where it gets a little bit confusing with Cape Brown squirrels, because I can tell you they have two levels of association, or they have three levels. And this is why. So I'll start with the two. It's because females have groups. And um, they have their retained offspring, which includes adult males, which have not dispersed yet, which are referred to as the NATO males. However, w the NATO males uh, will leave the group to go competitively search for estrus females. The females aren't leaving, they're the same with their group, and here goes the males running off to find some estrus females, and when they do that, they join the groups of the band males. Now, what are the band males but the males that will actually leave um, when they're adults, and they form these all-male bands, okay? All-male, unrelated males, running around the veld, sniffing out estrus females. So, you see why there's two levels of groups, right? We got the female, base groups, and then we got the band males, but then we got females, NATO males, band males. So which the social association are we going to go with depends on the research question. And as we tease it out, now, why, why are they grouping together, especially the males that are running around the veld looking for estrus females? It's the most supported hypothesis is anti-predator benefits, because everything eats them, it gives them um, some protection. Now this leads to uh, vigilance here, and so this is a bit of a funny picture because we, we see one standing on a termite mound, but they don't actually have sentinel behavior as we see in meerkats. There's not always one on guard, but they do have uh, uh, benefits from vigilance in that when they're in larger groups, there is more group vigilance going on, and with more group vigilance, individuals in larger groups are able to spend less time being vigilant themselves and more time feeding. So some very distinct benefits there. 
Okay, so we can look at the variation in, in, in cooperation when it comes to group vigilance. And what you're seeing here is I, I've highlighted the ones in, in, in the orange there, uh, the females. So who's doing more of the vigilance? We got females. They both adult females, sub-adult females, and intermediate to that are the natal males living in the groups with the females, um, and then the uh, dispersed or band males. So you want to know what else females do more? Snake mobbing. Okay, so the females are actually the ones who are doing most of the snake mobbing because here's a, here, I'll show you this. This is a duration in this one. This is intensity of harassment. You see it's overwhelmingly a maternal behavior. Females with juveniles are doing the high, highest rate of, um, of snake uh, harassment and snake inspection and then followed by females and we don't really see the, the, the males doing much of that. So kind of interesting to, to see that. And uh, all right, so you want to start thinking, okay, what are some of the other benefits of group living? Um, what I want to point out is, oh, sorry, that one, is that they spend most of their time feeding. These guys are feeding seeds, they're spending most of their time feeding, and it's not even just this number here, which is overwhelmingly big, locomotion, that's largely moving to new feeding sites, alert and sitting, they can actually feed and be vigilant at the same time, so they're feeding at the same time, and maintenance is, is grooming. So what I want to talk about is, okay, the rest of the time when they're not feeding, they're actually doing some social behaviors here. So what are these social behaviors? The majority of social interactions that we see in Cape Ground Squirrels is approach, um, greeting, or what's called kiss, and aloe grooming. So these guys are really, really aloe groomers. Oops. And the thing is, is so why are the aloe grooms so much? Well, this is an amazing thing, is that we, uh, we did this experiment where we, we combed the parasites out of some of the squirrels we caught, and then we treated them with flea medication to remove the parasites and see what happens. And, you know, we had this huge increase in reproduction, like four times. Four times. I mean, that's incredible. So that tells you that the parasites are um, really kind of decreasing reproductive fitness. And so, wow, this constant grooming uh, does confer fitness benefits. Okay, so they also do aloe care. And uh, I'll nominally just call this all babysitting, following, approaching, uh, greeting, aloe groom, and playing. So you notice that these uh, three behaviors, um, great approach, aloe groom, those are all the top behaviors in adults. And we can ask again, who is doing the care? Well, we got the mothers, and we got other females, which means that these are um, both adults and sub-adult females who are non-maternal. So they're caring for young, they're not their own. And we got some related natal males that are doing the care. But what's really cool is that recently we've just um, discovered that if we were to even break down the males that are given the care, because you're like, we're actually seeing that it's, it's younger. Oh, it's not working. Okay, so you see it's there to one-year-olds. Um, so basically sub-adults are given care, the one-year-olds are given care, and, um, and the older they get, the less they're, they're given care. So this is very interesting. They're remaining in the groups, but they're decreasing the amount of care that they're giving. Okay, I have to be on the side. Cool. Okay, so what we're seeing is a lot of within population variation in cooperation. So the social associations, uh, they, they, they differ with gender, right? We got females and males having different associations. Uh, the dispersal status, we have the males that stayed at home as native males and those who went in groups. And then we see that the type and extent of cooperation differs uh, depending on the, the type of social association. So there we go, I kind of summarized it, that even in these, these behaviors that are pr presented to you, that you know, not everybody's doing them at equal rates, right? So we got different ones that are different in cooperating ways. And this allows us, because this is a variation within a species and within a population, it allows us to start to tease apart why are they cooperating and why are they not in it. Uh, depending on the attributes of the individuals that are cooperating. So, 
This is why I want to look much more detail into the social system because I've given you a lot of information about the ecologies and, and, and the social associations. And, and now what we want to do, or what I want to do especially, is see, okay, let's, let's look right in depth into these systems. So I'm going to present that to you now so you can kind of see why these guys are e even more amazing than I could even say they are um, or express. So females, they are philopatric. Um, they live in family groups, and uh, the large groups, they split along the matter lines, meaning that when they, the groups get larger, the female leaves with her direct offspring. And uh, so they average about six individuals in size, and the composition varies anywhere from one to five adult females and up to nine sub-adults of either um, sex. And when they do split, the kin, the kin clusters always have a high degree of relatedness that remains stable over time. Now, this is a little bit, uh, a day in the life of a female Cape ground squirrel. When they wake up in the morning, they, they poke their heads out the cluster together. There's a lot of social interactions, the majority of which are allo grooming. And then they break up into smaller groups and they leave the burrow cluster and go out onto the veld to go forage in groups. And then they come back in the evening uh, before um, the sun goes down because they collect this nesting material or the bedding material. And then they'll have a lot more social interactions during this time period before going down for the day. And it's a stable social association. There you go. However, they have a choice of cooperative partners. Who are they going to choose um, to do these allegory behaviors, these social interactions? Uh, it could be relatedness, sex. It could be males and females. It could be the age classes, whether or not sub-adults or, or uh, juveniles. Um, could be based off these docile personalities. Um, and it could be completely dependent on, on, as well on ecological context. So this is why we want to study them in these depth. And how we're able to do this is because we paint their backs with these very strong visual marks that we can see from a distance. So this is done with hair dye. And what we do is we have this one tower at one of our main sites. And we have hides that we either put on top of a vehicle or in, um, on the ground. And the reason why we have to do this is because they're, they do not like humans on the veld. So we have to get there before they wake up and, and hide until they come and then, and then watch them as long as we're going to. Um, so in order to get some idea of their there's just spatial how they spatially assort themselves when they go about. We have this really beautiful geo-reference grid system of painted rocks. Okay, so why do you say rocks? It's because if we put up poles with stakes, the usual way some other studies like to do it, the, the, all these spring bok and the wildebeest, they come and, and they knock them down. So we don't have them anymore. And we tried flagging tape, but they, they, the schools steal it for, for, for their bedding. They, they like it. So this is our solution, and it works quite well. And so and it's completely georeferenced. So it means that from, and we can take images, and we can also figure out where they are. So it's, it's good. Uh, it works. So what we're looking at right now is that we're looking at their spacing during foraging. And um, so how do they... What are their relationships to each other while they forage? Remember, everything likes to eat them. Vigilance is a huge thing for them. And we're also looking at leader-follower behaviors and trying to also get an idea of if there's any cryptic dominance. Uh, if there is, um, because they're not aggressive, we want to say, okay, is, is there any, any interplay going on there in these social interactions? And so this is very, very preliminary, like, you know, a week ago. And uh, so this is looking at the Euclidean distances between nearest neighbor dyads. So this is, we have one individual, we say, who is their closest neighbor and how far are they from each other using this georeference system. And, I, and one of our hypotheses is maybe they're sticking closer to, to kin. So the most highly related individuals. Well, just looking at this plot, it doesn't really appear to be so. However, this is only using a, a mixed model approach, and we're going to be continuing on with this analysis using a much more social network approach and um, looking at whole uh, 
matrices of interactions. We also really interested to know if there are sorting by, by sex or females closer to females or by age group are females closer to subadults or or of any or or any of those associations. So that then leads to the other question we're looking at with them is the organization and structure when it comes to those social interactions we see them doing. So what's really striking about the data what that we've start looking at now is that affiliative interactions, which are the, the grooming and the approaching and the kissing behaviors, uh, they, they outnumber the agonistic interactions, which is when one walks away from the other, because that is as aggressive as they get. Remember, there is no biting, scratching, chasing, aggression. So you have to be like, oh, did they walk away from each other? You know, <laughs> and we have to, and um, there's only two cases of 235 where they actually physically touched to give you some reference, okay? So we want to understand who are they interacting with by creating these uh, networks based on, on how they're interacting. Uh, the preliminary analysis shows that they do socially interact more with more related group members, just using relatedness. Um, so however, there's a lot more work that needs to be done and breaking this down into particular behaviors. Uh, so to give you a little bit of context about this, um, we look at the female social system and uh, because we're wondering all this, this cooperation, all these social associations, is this benefiting them reproductively? And this is why I think this is because they have asynchronous spontaneous estrusis, which means that typically there's only one female in estrus at one time in a group and they're not doing it at the same time. And then when the female finally goes into estrus, she's in estrus for three hours. And in that time, she's attended to by 11 males. And she'll mate, she's promiscuous, so she'll mate with approximately four of them. But then she only has one to two young, mostly one. And when she has two, they're multiply sired. So, uh, wow, right? That's uh, a lot of promiscuous mating, a very short estrus. That seems kind of rough. And it actually is pretty rough for the females because about 70% of these observed estruses actually fail to wean young. I and mean, that's a really high. And to top that off, only about 40% of these adult ma females are actually going to produce young in their entire lifetime. Like this is the rate oops, of fa uh, failure that these guys go through. So you've seen this idea of, oh my goodness, okay, reproduction is hard for these females. Okay, might social associations help with that? Um, because they're plural breeders, which means they're all, uh, you know, breeders, and uh, and they give cooperative care, as I showed you earlier. And there's another twist to it, as these squirrels have lots of twists. There's reproductive suppression in the form of delayed maturity. So. There is association between the number of adult females and the number of related adult natal males and the age at first maturity. So the more, um, female, the more females, the, the, the later the, uh, the subadults become mature. Now, the question is then with this delayed maturity, are the breeding females receiving help from the non-reproductive females? Kind of looks like it does from the preliminary data I showed you. Remember, there's the females that were, were helping. But this is a real interesting one. The number of related adult NATO males. The more NATO males are in the group, the later the maturity of the females. And this could be inbreeding avoidance. But it also means that the NATO males are uh, maybe conferring a, a cost to, to being in the group. Like they're costing something for remaining in the group because there is this delayed uh, um, maturity here. So let's get to the NATO males and okay, who are these NATO males who are staying in this group who are possibly cost to have reproductive repercussions for the females when reproduction is pretty hard for them already? Um, well, okay, then you have to understand the males now, okay? So we got intense reproductive competition. Remember, they have to compete for that, that one or two you know, offspring that the female is going to have. And they got to find her in that three hour estrus over the whole belt. And only one, less than one third of them are ever going to sire offspring in their lifetime. Even worse odds than the females. Oh, but you know what they do have? Remember, they're not aggressive, right? You don't see these guys fighting. But they got 
big testicles. Okay, second largest that we know of in, in, in the squirrels, right? A 20% of the head body length, that is insane, which suggests the level of sperm competition that they have. And remember, they're not fighting, they're docile. And what's really cool about it is actually the docile ones have more offspring. Oh, I love this result. This is recent stuff that I've done as well. Okay, so the nice guys actually are coming out ahead. They are uh, having more offspring. Cool, right? So then you start to think about this docility again. It's like, okay, we got these squirrels that are not very aggressive at all. Um, and you start to think about this idea called pace of life. So in pace of life, it's the idea, in a, a, for instance, a fast pace of life is, um, you know, live hard, you know, live fast, you know, reproduce early, die young. And it's kind of what we see with the uh, smaller mammals. So with smaller mammals, um, we see that they, rep they have shorter lifespans. Uh, oh, dear. And they... Uh, they have shorter lifespans and they, they reproduce uh, many offspring quite quickly and generally more aggressive individuals um, have more offspring. And this is typical of the smaller mammals. Now, if we go to a slower pace of life, we've got larger mammals, they tend to be longer lived, they have, um, they have fewer offspring at once and they're less aggressive. This is kind of what the Cape ground squirrels do. They live up to nine years, which is you know, reasonably long for, for a rodent, and they have one to two offspring at once, and they're not aggressive. So this is actually interesting because it is less usual for a small mammal. All right. So, you know, this lack of aggression, is it driving some of these associ social associations and cooperation? And I'd like to note that, okay, when you keep thinking about this lack of aggression, this lack of aggression, you, and you know that they have different associations, um, there's a question of, okay, are, do they have different personalities? And I can say, no, no, they do not. Whether or not they're NATO male or band male, um, the docile personalities we see are, are not linked to these tactics. So there we go, the NATO males, uh, where, where they're living with females, they have... Uh, it's the same characteristics as them, but what's interesting about them is their kinship decreases over time. And that's because as they get older, the females are promiscuous, they get less and less related to those in their group. So they already have different uh, kinship associations than the females do. And what's really interesting is, is when does a natal disperse and move tactics to ban males, um, I have found that this, this is linked to rainfall. So this means, uh, and remember rainfall is linked to the amount of food that's out there. So in years with higher rainfall, there's actually more banned males proportionally in the population. And then in all the cases that we saw of males that dispersed, they always did it in a year with higher rainfall. So it rains, they're like, I'm out of here, I'm taking my chances. And I can totally discuss the reasons why behind this on the hormonal and body condition stuff if you're interested later. We won't go into that right now. So then we finally get to the ban males. So they've dispersed, they've gone on, they're in these, these all male groups and, um, and this is where the social associations get really cool. Okay, they, they are fission fusion dynamics. There are small groups that forge during the day together and larger sleeping aggregations, and these are unrelated males living in groups. And to give you an idea of this, this is what happens in the lives of these guys, and not even just a day here. So they, they wake up from their sleeping groups, they do all those social associations that we see with females, then they go out to forge together in smaller groups that are like four to five males. But they're kind of fluid, you know, they go off and then they might move to another group and move to the group and there's, there's, it, they're open memberships, nobody's coming in doing behaviors to say, hey, can I join your group? It's like, nah, they just move around different groups. And then they get together in a, a larger sleeping group. That is not necessarily the same structure as the one that they were sleeping in before. And then they repeat. So we got these ephemeral fluid groups with open membership. And we really don't know what the social organization looks like um, because this is all going on while 
were not on the VELT because you have to stake them out and look at them at one snapshot in time. But we do know that we want to know if they have consistent partnerships. Are they grouping by what sort of features, personalities, experience, relatedness, what other attributes, like all these fluid groups that they move around, why, right? So this is why we're going to, we're tacking them up, right? It's because they move over huge areas of the valve. We're looking at over 30 hectares for one male feeding association. And uh, they've done radio collars, but you're never going to get enough data because they're all over the valve and you have to find them without them seeing you, right? So we've using these prox loggers um, that are developed by Lucy Kirkpatrick et al uh, for actually a much smaller species, a multi mammate mouse. And uh, we've, we've deployed them right here. We've put them on their necks. And what they are is that their little um, technology that every single time they come in proximity to another male with the loggers, it's going to log that they're within 20 centimeters, and, which is good because remember they're allo groomers, so they get really close to each other. And then we know that we have the association. So we can look at that during foraging, we can look at it during sleeping, and they'll be taking the data when they're underground, the burrows when we can't see them. So we've big brother them up so we can figure out what they're doing. So finally get to, okay, how are we going to link all this sociality? So I've been talking about all of these really cool ideas with, with sociality and cooperation, but uh, let's, let's talk about what this means in, in today's world in terms of ecology and climate change. Um, so remember how I said rainfall is associated with, with productivity and food. And then we know NATO males, they disperse during high rainfall. And that means that rainfall is actually influencing social structure and organization in the species. But we also know that the ones that are given allocare are NATO males. So when the NATO males all move because of rainfall so, and social association changes, the amount of cooperation changes. So we have these very interesting links to look at. And indeed, at our field site, we, we have this huge variation in rainfall going on, but what in the last couple years we've had massive dumps of rain, which are right off of this chart here. And we don't know how long it's going to go for, um, but more strikingly is this temperature change. So this is maximum temperature up here, and what's going on is that our field site has gone up on average by two and a half degrees Celsius in the last two decades. That is actually quite a lot. And uh, so you go, okay, so what? It's like, well, you know, I, I decided, oh, that's bad. I got to look at this because that, that, ew, that's two and a half degrees. And uh, wow, um, these guys have undergone some morphological changes connected um, to this temperature rise, which are consistent with those that are predicted by ecogeographic models, but not only that, the sort of changes you expect with increased global temperatures. Um, so look at these honkingly huge feet here for a ground squirrel. I mean, they're huge. And uh, proportionally over time, these, these, these hind feet are going up. So what, why is that important? It's because in desert arid adapted species, hot weather adapted species as these squirrels, these large appendages help them dissipate heat to keep their bodies cooler. And they've gone up. Like, wow. So that's not the only change they've done too. Okay, their spine length, so it represents a body size has gone down, and that's also predicted with rising temperatures. Okay, so physically these guys have changed in concordance with the temperature changes going up. Physiologically, we're going to have a look at that, and socially, potentially also, and behaviorally, there might be behaviorally changes going on with climate change. Okay, so at this point, you know, you're going to say, okay, like, so what though? So what? How does this relate to climate change? Yes, it does, actually, because of another interesting feature about these guys is that they modify the vegetation and burrow structures. Uh, with their burrow structures, they modify the vegetation and they actually increase diversity of insects and also other smaller um, mammals, like, like um, around them. So here's the belt. See if you can see the burrow clusters. You can see them coming. You get on that veldt, and uh, after you're done being stunned by the beauty of it out there, you just go, wow, you can, you can see the burrow clusters coming. They are 
there, but they persist in the environment because they make the burrow clusters and they go, eh, I don't like this one as much. And they'll move and make another and be there for years. And they'll even come back a few years later and then redig things out and, and use that. And not only that is that they're changing the landscape, uh, it's used by other species like meerkats and yellow mongooses um, move in and just use them too. So it's, they're changing the environment. And this is cool because research has shown that more intense impacts, um, there are more intense impacts of ecosystem engineers when they're social because they don't just make one burrow, they make a burrow cluster and multiple clusters across the landscape. And um, they are drivers of biodiversity in actually grasslands which are threatened globally. Okay, so you see where I'm going with this. The cool thing is, is, is that um, their sociality, which could change because of climates, is gonna change the sort of impact they have on the landscape. And this changes biodiversity. So sociality is linked to any changes that are going to occur with uh, the climate and the environmental changing. So with that, I can finish and just say, okay, these guys are amazing creatures and they give you a different perspective on the evolution of social living and cooperation uh, for all of these unique features that they have. They're cooperative breeders, they have fish infusion dynamics, no terriers, no physical aggression. They seem to exhibit a slower pace of life, which is typical of smaller mammals, and they are ecosystem engineers. So if I have not given you enough information about these Cape squirrels and leave you craving more, there is a fine lecture coming up by Jane Waterman, who is one who started this uh, project years ago. And thank you so much for listening. Stun the audience. So I, I probably missed this. Why more males than females? <clears throat> Why there are more males than females that are in the middle? Why the is the population of sex ratio is that so uh, skewed? Oh, because we have one female that is in estrus because they, ha they don't have estruses at the same time. So, yeah. And then all the males just flock to her. I see. And, then, and then I wonder, I, this um, the tolerant temperament mm -hmm. because I am, um, uh, remind me of that the Borobo and chimpanzee mm -hmm. to some extent. And then that the people are talking about evolution, but that's such different in Borobos and chimpanzees. And then in your opinion, what do you think about that, uh, what drives this uh, temperament uh, in, in, in this species? And may, the, temp the docile temperament or the male groupings? Docile I'm sorry. Temperament. Docile temperament. I think it's because life is pretty hard for them. Um, they almost like don't have time to be Bickering. I mean, you spend how much time they spend feeding. They spend, uh, you know, more recent numbers are shown 80%, 80 percent of their time they're spending feeding, and uh, you know, there's only and then there's only so much time they have left for other activities. And uh, reproduction, you see, is hard for the females. The females, uh, they, they're all breeding. They're all breeders, but they have such a high failure rate. And um, the males have to find these scarce females. I mean, three hours estrus, and they wander around the veldt, you know, because they're, they're wandering over a large area to get their food. They have to find the estrus female. They have to find her. They don't have time to fight. Oh, and if they fight, they might be eaten by all the things. I think it's just really hard life. Um, they're just, it's just going to cooperation is just more beneficial. I mean, watch each other's back, find the females. The only time there's any competition is in during competitive searching. And it's not aggressive. It's just where everybody's like, okay, every male for himself. Okay, there's an estrus female out here in this burrow cluster. Everybody go, right? And uh, yeah, yeah, so, then, they, <laughs> uh, so female prefer those animals during competition. So the female is aggressive ones. Uh, we, ha we don't know if it's preference or not. We know the DOSA males are ones who are siring more offspring. We have to, it does suggest female choice, but we, we need to show that. The problem is sometimes the female goes down into the burrow where we cannot see them and the male will come go down. And if he's there longer than three minutes, we assume that there's a copulation going on. Sometimes he pops right back up and we don't know 
what's up with that? He'll go down, he'll come back up. It could be that underneath ground, she's kind of run off and things. There's a lot of things we can't see underground. That's why we're putting tech on them. Any other questions? Yes. So I know that in Namibia, they have been having a big drought for like the past seven or eight years now. Yeah. Uh, has the rainfall been affected in South Africa as well? Uh, at our site, it, you see it was really variable, goes up and down, but the last couple of years it's been really high. We have records going back to 1950 that we just retrieved. So at our field site in itself, um, we're not sure. Now, I know that the reports have shown that in, in some regions it's, it's, it is getting a lot drier, but, and that's probably the variation you can see within the Cape ground squirrels in, in different populations. But Namibia is much drier, and uh, previous to this, in the 1990s, Jane Waterman, she started her studies in Namibia, so, um, so we know that the, the resources are different there. And uh, a recent paper just came out with colleagues of mine where she showed the mating systems are just subtly different between Namibia, where it's drier and lower resources compared to, to uh, um, S.A. Lombard, where are we at? But they're still not aggressive there, by the way. So, yes. Yeah, I still, I, I'm still um, puzzled by the fact that, like, on the one hand, you really um, worked out very well that, like, um, reproductive success is really, um, uh, like, 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 is a rare resource. And, yeah. And some males have many offsprings, and, and many males have none. It yeah. seems true for the females as well. So there's a huge competition yes. on the one hand, and on the other hand, you said like there's <coughs> there's little on the behavioral level. There's no aggression, and and um, there's little you can identify on the level of um, mate choice on the female side. So what like like on some level that 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 competition must play out, but on which on which level does that happen? What so happens is cooperation for the other? Of, of, of mate choice among, um, like, like female um, mate choice, and what's, what's the, like on, on which level, like what, what, what can a male do to increase um, his reproductive success? If there's no but maybe it's not aggression. Aggression doesn't seem to serve in the species. Um, so um, some of the work that we're looking at now is looking at the level of um, allogrooming that females are given. Remember, if you look at the females, the females are the ones who are actually doing most of the allogrooming. Oh, maybe I didn't prep represent that, <laughs> put that up there. So the females are doing a lot of the allogrooming um, compared to the males. And so that's one of the things that, that we're looking at is this relationship between allogrooming, the, um, the difference between uh, pay to stay, do they help to stay in the group, or the benefits of staying in the group versus whether or not they're actually getting allogrooming in the, in, in the form of a payment. Because remember how much the uh, parasites really seem to affect these species. So there could be parasite interactions going on. They are just major allogroomers. I mean, I can put up like a million pictures of them grooming each other, so. Here? Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Uh, so yeah, I was curious to know a little bit more about the uh, response to, uh, or the morphological changes to climate change. And I see that since you mentioned that you have been collecting data for a couple of, well, a lot of years now, what was the response in the opposite uh, when we had the very dry periods between 2015 and 16, if there was a, like an opposite morphological response? And also if given that these are looking at the NOAA patterns, we see that these um, rainfall droughts periods are kind of cyclical. If you think that rather than climate change, this is just a, uh, a long-term oscillation of, of behavioral plasticity to, to weather rather than an immediate climate change response. If uh, if you could elaborate a bit more on the long term. Sure, let me break that, that down, that question for you. So, um, so to start with the rainfall, um, 
so with rainfall, you s it's it's really like you said the oscillations here. And so um, for this model, I was looking at the, the, the change over time in the last two decades because two decades is actually not that much time. So rainfall itself has not been increasing nor decreasing. Um, so. In that respect, this study is not modeling morphological change with rainfall. It, it focuses on the temperature. So definitely, we can do something with rainfall, um, but those you, we're working on that with more complex models because when it comes to hind foot size, it's actually complicated because hind feet, especially in these small mammals, are also related to locomotion. And we do have a study that suggests... Um, that perhaps some of these these foot size could could be could be related to vegetation and things. So, and also you got to keep in mind that there's also going to be a lag in what we see. So we have to incorporate the the uh, the food resource and, and and the oscillations of the temperature into what will be eventual changes. But all really cool stuff that you're saying. Okay, so the second part of yours was what was the second part? You were related to. Oh dear, I've already lost what the second part of this question was. Yeah. The, the long-term behavioral plasticity, whether it's morphology or just behavior, but when we go from drought periods to to extreme drought, drought periods to extreme uh, rainfall periods or wet periods. The particular study I was representing was, was temperature. So that was looking at um, the morphology. Oh morphological change with temperature. Um, so if you're talking about behavioral plasticity, which I did not cover in this study, it's just an idea to move forward. Um, the actually, so I'm trying to say, um, we don't have anything within the site for behavior plasticity to look at the how that fluxes with temperature. Um, but we, what we do know is that there are differences in um, group, um, the mating strategies uh, and, and grouping uh, nominally between the low resource site in Namibia versus the, the South African site, which is the high resource site and high rainfall. I don't know if I answered your question there, but. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I just have another one just for clarification. When you say that there is no aggression, is it between within the group or also between groups, there is no aggression? There's no aggression between and within groups. We just do not see it in the species. Okay, that it's and difficult. there isn't really uh, groups to fight in because they have these really fluid, like the males have these really fluid um, groupings, and so it's not like they have consistent groups, right? They go from small different foraging groups to small different sleeping groups, and the female groups, which are more consistent, where they live at different um, like burrow structures, there's no aggression between those groups, and they have range overlap. Not territories, range overlap in the forest. Uh, yes, I'm all good. Thank you. From comparative perspective, we should say that uh, these guys face harsh environment. And then, that, uh, is there any other species that uh, don't, uh, enjoy that the richer, much richer environment? So they have a social system, especially male temperament, and also racial sex relations. How do they differ between those smart species? One okay, so we're talking about non-aggressive males. Yeah, are you talking about the... How those are uh, the one species that are facing passion in these guys? Or are the other species that are facing uh, much richer? In this case, I'm drawing from bison to follow Japan again. All over the, uh, having a, the rich uh, environment, yeah. but the uh, female domain, and then males are much stronger. And then the chimpanzee are very harsh, mm -hmm. more harsh environment, but oh, the uh, males are. And then this guy seems to look what he said. Is, we saw, yeah. yeah. That's a difficult one. Because, so the ground squirrels are desert adapted, which is pretty harsh but if you look at the other squirrel species that have been predominantly studied a lot of them are in the in temperate zones or in the arctic zones like they're really well studied in the arctic and they're also they're tundra so they're pretty harsh too and uh 
Yeah, I'm not sure I can really answer that. It's there's a lot of variation, but uh, resource rich and the, the the reason why I think about it this way is because predation is a really big factor that plays into the small mammals. So only it feels like this is almost more like dominating some of some of their social structures compared to the actual resource that's available. Because when you look at the capes, they it's not a cape ground squirrels. It's not a problem for them to kind of get out and, and feed and they're spending a lot of their time feeding and they're not ever running out of food, it seems like. But they have this whole, um, a lot of contending with the predation. And so I haven't really quite answered your question, but I think the, the short answer is that well, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, species that yeah. Do they tend to be a solitary? That's a conversation. Just a thing. Huh. A lot of asocial squirrels. I'm thinking of red squirrels and in the boreal boreal zone, and they're they're asocial. Oh, but what's interesting about the red squirrels is that the males will actually group during female estrus, just when the females in estrus. But they are aggressive and they fight with each other, and they have dominance hierarchies. And that would, I guess, be a richer environment, but you still see that aggression, but enough toleration to group just while the females as in estrus, so shows some ability to moderate the aggression. But yes, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, hi. Sure. So thank you for your talk. Um, you had a slide with different types of alloparental care. And I was wondering whether you can elaborate on these different types of alloparental care because I'm not sure that I would have defined them as alloparental care. You had like greeting and follow and approach. Uh, I was wondering why do you think, why would you say that this is alloparental care? Okay, yes. Okay, yeah. so we normally call this babysitting. Okay, um, so what happens is that the, uh, to do bluntly put it, the babies are really dumb and, and they can be, <laughs> they have a high level of predation. And so when you follow them, they're keeping that proximity to them. And you see that how close proximity they're keeping to them, as well as the aloe grooming behavior. So um, very preliminary stuff. Uh, it, we're looking at survival rates and how this increases the survival of the young and uh, it suggests that yes, these behaviors and their, their presence and their, their proximity to that actually do increase their survival. Um, and what other behaviors were you thinking about? Were you thinking about feeding? Because they, they can't really feed the young, right? Because they're, they're great yeah. seed eaters. It's like, oh, there's grass seeds, eat it, you know? So it's not like when you see in the, the um, more carnivorous species, like the, the surrogates where they're actually like teaching them how to, um, and they're bringing food to them and teaching them how to bite the scorpion tail off that. We, we, don't, we don't have the, um, they don't have those, those behaviors there. Um, yeah, but I mean, I could think about like do you have any other behaviors that you were thinking of, like for example, um, directed babysitting. So one of uh, the adult or sub adult stays behind while the rest of the group move on. So well, if we are only them. talking about social proximity, yeah. I mean that can be just like um, uh, an indirect result of sociality. And I would not sure people will define it as alloparental care and therefore not as cooperative breeding. Um, okay, yeah. So um, the thing is that when they move along, they, 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 don't, they don't leave their young behind. They move as a group. So it's not like when you see the meerkats, they go off foraging and, and they come back, right? These guys, when they leave the burrow cluster, they move as a group and they spread over the area while they're foraging. So um, yes, definitely I can say that we could do some more work showing um, the, the proximity distances. As you see the social uh, analysis stuff that I, I presented later is going to be aimed at that as well, looking at, at that um, proximity to see if if it indeed is is much less or much more into that because there's definitely definitely a lot more we can do with um the allo care but the thing is what we're seeing here is the the cape ground scores have a very different social system compared to some of the co-opter breeding mammals that we see and their movement patterns uh are different uh, as a res result of how they move over the landscape and socially associate with each other thank you